Hey, 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 welcome back in, everyone. This is Jason Dutch, and the curtain is up. Hello, how are we doing? Hey, so thank you for joining me for the second ever episode of um, All Things Equal from Jason Dutch, a voice from the underground. So um, today I want to talk about something that is a little bit difficult to talk about um and forgive me i got a little scratchy throat today so if i have to clear it sorry but um so yesterday we had yet another mass shooting in the united states and this one took place in uh, the midland odessa texas area the second one in less than a month in texas and the third one in the united states um in the last in the same time frame with the other being in Ohio. And um, this is obviously something that I think everybody, whether you're on the right or the left of the gun debate, um, wants to see some change. Like nobody, I don't think anybody sits at home and says, oh yeah, boy, look, them people are dying. It's always fun to watch. You know, it's, yeah, we're desensitized by movies and stuff like that, but uh it's a really unfortunate situation. It's tragic. And this one hit a little bit close to home for me because uh, my my brother-in-law uh, works in Midland. So, you know, when I first saw that, I was like, holy shit. You know what I mean? Pardon my French, but I was worried for a second that, you know, it could hit closer to home than normal. Um, luckily, he wasn't at work that day. So thank God for that. Right. But, um, but nonetheless, there are what, five, six people who did lose their lives and another 20 or something that were shot yesterday. Um, and, and were injured in some way who obviously are being adversely affected by this issue. So, um, again, this show is, is meant to be from a centrist point of view. Sometimes I'm going to be on the left. Sometimes I'm going to be on the right. And in this one, really in the middle i really am but i i see the i see the, what both sides are talking about on this um so i made some notes here i'm going to pull some of these notes up and um and and talk about them with you guys because i'm going to try to be as centrist as possible here but we'll we'll go where we're going to go so um there was a um again a shooting that took place the other day um, there is a debate on both sides of this that I'm going to read a little bit on uh, from pros and cons. Now, this particular article is from a website called uh, procon.org. It's a really interesting website. I've used it a few times um, on my podcast as well as uh, just in conversation and research and that sort of thing. So a um, few facts about guns in the United States, first and foremost. Um, the United States has 120.5 guns per 100 people. That's far and away number one in the Western world and I believe also in, in the world. That's about 393 million guns. 22% um, of Americans own one or more guns, 35% men, 12% women. So this gun culture basically... It, it obviously it stems from from the colonial history, right? Like in the 1780s and 1790s is when the um, the Constitution was written, as well as the the first couple of amendments. But long before that, people came here and they owned guns, and they had to own guns because obviously, if you're a pioneer, or frontiersman, or a 49er, you're not going to go hiking across a wilderness full of bears and wolves, and not expect to have to to protect yourself and also obviously you have you know the native americans there who you know that's a different story because they were treated like garbage by us and 
We looked at them as lesser people. That side of the conversation we could talk about another day. Not right now. I don't, I don't want to get into that part of it, but I do recognize it. But nonetheless, um, you know, you had Native Americans who would obviously want to protect their territory. And like, who is this fair skinned fella wandering through here wearing a raccoon skin hat? <laughs> so um, the idea that we would that we would venture out on these adventures and not have guns if they were available to us, then that, that idea is a bit, is a bit silly. Um, also for food, you have to hunt, you have to be able to, you know, shoot quail or turkey or whatever it was that you're, that you need to, to shoot to live, right? You figure you got to have pots, pans, some yeast and a gun and obviously warm clothing. So that's where the culture kind of comes from. But uh, as we, as we progress forward, into the 1780s and 1790s, obviously there was no standing army. So I'm going to read for you guys the the Second Amendment. Um, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So this is up for a, a lot of debate lately. And it basically comes down to what and how do you interpret the Second Amendment. People have different perspectives. People are always going to perceive things differently. But one thing that I think a lot of people forget is the fact that it was a well-regulated militia is why we needed this. Now, at the time, there was no standing army. So the states would have to defend themselves from either a tyrannical government or from outside invaders, which at the time was a re pretty real threat. Now, the United States, thankfully, hasn't been attacked in a military style since Pearl Harbor, not, not counting, of course, the, the September 11th attacks. So proponents of more gun control laws state that the Second Amendment was, in, was intended for militias, uh, that gun violence would be reduced, and that gun restrictions have always existed, that a majority of Americans including gun owners, support new restrictions. While opponents say that the Second Amendment protects an individual's right to own guns, um, that guns are needed for self-defense, ranging from local criminals to foreign invaders, et cetera, as, as I mentioned before. So, and this is why I really love this website, because it's very, very nonpartisan. I know that that's, that's something that we don't see a lot these days, is something that's actually nonpartisan. And in this site, I think it does a really good job of doing that. So again, it's procon.org, P-R-O-C-O-N.org. Um, and they talk about a lot of different stuff, not just gun control. So um, I'm going to read just briefly from here before I give my, my, my opinion on this. So uh, on the pro side, in June, two, June 26, 2008, um, the Heller case, the Supreme Court majority opinion given by Justice Scalia said, most, like most rights, the right secured by the Second Amendment is not unlimited. Nothing, in our opinion, should be taken to cast doubt on the long-standing prohibitions on the possession of firearms by felons and or the mentally ill or laws forbidding the carrying of firearms in sensitive places such as schools and government buildings. I'm, I'm, I'm shortening that phrase a bit because it goes on. Um, on the con side, and this is again a con to gun control. The Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution reads, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the free state and the right to, of people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Gun ownership is an American tradition older than the country itself and protected by the Second Amendment. More gun control laws would infringe upon the right to bear arms. Um, the, um, the second pro, more gun control laws would reduce gun deaths. There were 572,000 total gun deaths between 99 and 2016. 213,000 of those were homicides, 11,000 accidental, and then 51% of, uh, of these were suicides. The con, gun control laws do not deter crime. Gun ownership deters crime. Now, this is the one that Trump was talking about. Like, And the NRA talks about this a lot. You know, you need a good guy with a gun. Um, maybe we should arm school teachers, that sort of thing, that the threat of having a gun there would deter a violent crime. Here's the crazy part. I think both of these 
opinions are actually correct. I think that if you know that Joe Schmo has a gun and Jane Doe next door does not, and you are going to rob one of these houses, you will probably rob Jane. I agree with that. If you know that Bank of America on State Street has three armed guards and Chase on Main Street has one, and you're going to rob a bank, you're probably going to rob the Chase. I get that. It makes complete sense, right? Crime is risk and reward. That's all it is, risk versus reward. What am I going to get? What's my risk? Every person who commits a crime, assuming that they're you know, not a complete psychopath, weighs the risk versus the reward. Um, at the same time, if there are less guns on, out there, legal and illegal, then you have less people who can get their hands on them, and the math just always works out. Now, a lot of people will say, you know what, well, you know, taking away the legal guns doesn't do anything about the, the illegal guns. But the fact of the matter is, is that the majority of guns that are sold in the black market are stolen or acquired illegally, but manufactured in the United States or Israel, um, as, as most guns that we have here are. The, these guns are not being shipped in from, from Russia on crates it, you know, coming on, o- on overseas containers. That's just typically not the way that they are. Now, some do come from Latin America. That is absolutely correct, along with drugs. We know that this is the case. Um, it's not really an argument for the wall, though, in my opinion, though I won't talk about that much on, on this podcast because those come th- typically these, these items will come through legal ports of entry. They're just smuggled in quite well. But I think that both of those arguments do carry a little bit of weight. So the question becomes, what do we do? Now, we always have laws that change. You know, employment laws have changed to protect workers. Drug laws have changed as different drugs have come onto the market and um, people have been affected by them. Um, it used to be okay to marry a, a, a 12-year-old girl. You know, if you ever watched Little House in the Prairie, it was probably not something that I would have liked to have had done, but you know, you used to be able to marry a, a woman far long before she was 18 years old. You know, laws change on gay marriage, on truancy at school, sexual harassment, voting rights. Um, as we progress as a society, voting rights have changed. Um, you used to be able to throw a woman in jail for wearing provocative swimwear. That law changed. So why, I ask you, are guns not subject to change? Why? Guns have changed. There is absolutely no way that the Founding Fathers could have anticipated a bazooka. Now, obviously, I can't go buy a bazooka. But the fact of the matter is, is there's no way that they would have said, oh, yeah, well, we're going to have bazookas in 100 years, so we have to write a law for bazookas. No, they didn't. They said, okay, we don't have a standing army. We're always at risk of war, so we have to be able to form militias um, to protect ourselves from not only our own government if it's taken over, because obviously there was a lot of risk that we would go back into uh, a tyrant king situation like we had in, in England. There's a lot of fear of monarchies back then. It almost is like the fear of communism in the 80s. Um, it was the fear of, of, of a monarchy back then. So things have changed quite a bit. The Founding Fathers did not see M16s or AR15s or anything like that as being realistic. Flamethrowers, all this stuff was is like new. So we we have to adapt as a society just like we adapt to anything else. But at the same time protect the rights of gun owners like myself. I own a gun, it's 3 feet from me. Of course it's kept safe. Now the, the, the thing about the, the Second Amendment, and I know that this video is probably going to be a little bit longer than most of mine, is that 
when the narrative around the Second Amendment kind of changed in the 1980s. Um, prior to that, it really w- was not what a lot of people did, I guess the easiest way to say this is they took away the top, they started quoting the second amendment without the first part about the militia and that narrative sort of changed. And, um, there was a quote from, uh, from Warren Berger, who was the, a GOP supporter. He was a Republican. He was the chief justice of the Supreme court. And and he was retired when he said this, but he basically has said, look, what's going on right now, this new interpretation of the second amendment is a complete fraud. The NRA sort of shifted their uh, views on this, too. Of course, the NRA is supported by gun lobbyists and gun manufacturers. So I'm sorry, but they're a little bit corrupt. They, they serve some good as well. But their motivation is money. Simple as that. Um, oftentimes, you'll hear the argument that you need a license to drive a car. So, so why do you not need one for a firearm? Then... The right wing will say, well, you know, there's a difference between a right and a privilege. I'm going to say on this one, on my opinion, gun ownership is definitely a privilege. You can prove this very quickly because if you're a felon, you lose it. So that brings us in to uh, these red flag laws that people are talking about. So Red flag laws, I think, are a good idea. I do understand that there is some risk of people trying to sabotage you if, you know, if your five neighbors think you're a weirdo for whatever reason. Maybe you are. I know I am. Um, you know, they can gang up on you and say, oh, you know, I want him to take his guns away because I don't like the guy's political viewpoints or his religion. Maybe he's Muslim and you just don't want the Muslim guy to own a gun because you're afraid of him or something. Um, you know, people could do that. Most people would be wrong. But you would have to trust that the judge would be able to look into that. And what, and what I find funny is like when people are so worried about their rights, but when you have a mass shooting, it's almost like, yeah, I'm sad those people died. I'll cry for today, and then tomorrow I'll get back to my life, and, but just don't mess with my rights. Why should my rights be infringed upon you know, because somebody else did something? And I'm not sure that I, that I necessarily agree with that. You know, it's... Um, but at the same time, I'm not advocating for, for people to give up their handguns. I, I just think that when you, like an AR-15 is fun to fire. I get it, right? It's a blast, literally and figuratively. But you can do this at a gun range. You don't necessarily have to have it in your house. And if if I own an AR-15, let's say that I, let's say that I own one, I'm going to keep it locked up in a cage, in a gun vault, right? That gun vault may or may not be in my bedroom. If someone breaks into my house, I would think that I could put my hand on my little safe and pull my gun out of it, my Springfield 9mm, and pull that out, pop the clip in, and get to that a lot quicker than I would to my AR-15, which is in a gun vault. I, and if you're not keeping it in a gun vault, then you shouldn't be owning a gun. That's just my thought on this one. I'm not pretending that what I'm saying here is, is biblical. Um, because that's your situation may be different, but it seems to me that it would be quicker to get to the handgun. I can put a handgun in a drawer right next to my, uh, my bed. I cannot do that with an AR-15. Um, and so, I, and like I said, I, I understand AR-15s are fun to fire. Then we can go and rent them from a gun range. Where are you going to shoot it at anyway? I mean, is it that important to your life at a, as a whole to have it, to, to, to be able to go into the Nevada desert and shoot your gun? Is it, I mean, is it really that important to you that you should be able to do that, that and, and not only you, but everybody else who may not be as well trained with guns, because that's another thing too. People aren't always as well trained with guns as you may be, but yet there's no restriction. So like, I will admit I'm not like a gun enthusiast. I'm not a hunter. I don't like get a erection from shooting my gun. It's just, I have it for protection. That's it. I hardly ever pull it out. I'm more or less, 
terrified of the thing because I know if I take it out, there's risk something could happen. Very, very tiny, but the risk becomes higher than zero. Okay? So I've seen a lot of people who when they pull when they take their gun out of their safe, they instinctively, because we were used to playing with squirt guns and stuff, you know, they put their finger on the trigger. Now it takes active learning to learn not to do that. Any established gun owner will tell you you never put your your finger on the trigger unless you are about to use it. But that is a learned behavior. You have to be taught that by your dad or by your uncle or by someone at the gun range. Instinctively, that's not what we do, right? So when when someone does that, people say, oh, look at this guy. He's an idiot. He doesn't know how to handle a gun. Then why would we let him own it? Why would you let him own it without taking a proper course and learning how to use it just to keep himself safe from accidental? We saw in that other report, 11,000 people died um, in the that 10-year period because of accidental shootings. You know, so we do have to have some responsibility here. So, I mean, and again, with AR-15s, my house is not being attacked by ninjas, so not only do I think it would be harder to get to it, I don't really think it, it's necessary. It's not really, it is overkill, in my opinion, to have to have uh, all these high-powered, high-magazine guns. And I know AR-15s are not a super strong gun. I get that, right? They're, as far as the, the power of the bullet, there are far more powerful guns out there, and even many handguns that are more powerful but what it is is it's the clip size, right? And the ease of and the ease of use. It's much easier to spray the street with that than it is to do a herky jerky motion with the hand with your hand. That's just a simple fact. Now, I know if you're a right winger, you're listening to this guy, he doesn't know what he's talking about. But you have to listen to facts. I think it's sixty eight percent of all mass shootings were committed with a gun. That was not a handgun. So to to ignore that is a bit irresponsible. So I, I know that I'm a little over on how lar- how long I usually like to go on these. Um, so as far as solutions, this is the difficult part because I don't really know uh, that that there is like this one perfect answer. But I don't think that we should go door to door and pick people's guns up if they're um, whether they, they make AR-15s illegal or whether it's something with a red flag law and and I actually neglected to finish my thought on red flag law so I'll put a pin in that and come back to it in a minute but the um, if you if you go door to door you're going to have issues there have been a couple of cases of people who were Supposed to have their weapons taken away because of red flag laws, but decided to have a shootout with the police and were killed instead. Or worse yet, shoot a police officer. So I'm not sure that you want ATF coming to you to go in door to door to collect these things. That would probably cause a lot of issue. But what you could prob- probably do is to give some sort of a tax incentive. So say, hey, you know what? Whether um, it probably wouldn't be applicable in the case of a red flag. Uh, repossession, but it would be if they were to outlaw the guns um, and maybe restrict their use only to the the range where you can go and rent one from the range or you can own it and keep it at the range um, and and use it there as much as you want, buy ammo as you're there. Um, You can either have it relegated to the range and put it into the responsibility of that range. And if you want to go out of town, have it shipped to a different range, right? Um, or rent one when you get there, if it's that important to you. So the, but, but the, um, the other thing is, is that you can give a tax credit. So if you were giving a tax credit of say 300% of the value of that gun to turn it in, and then it can be used by either military or law enforcement or training or something of that nature or sold to a gun range, you know, so that they can rent it out to people who want to come in and do some sports shooting. I think that a tax break would be a good way to try to facilitate that. And then if the people who don't comply with it but are legally registered to own it, then you can give them some sort of tax penalty until they turn it in. 
Now, obviously, these things would go to the Supreme Court, and they'd have to stand up to scrutiny, and I get that. Um, this obviously doesn't do anything about illegal guns as well, the ones that are already out there. But by keeping filtering new legal guns to the street, you are going to stem the flow of illegal guns at some point in time, and then as they are recouped or confiscated, that number is going to start going down. And I think the goal here, and like I said, I'm not pretending to have answers here. I'm not. I'm just trying to throw ideas out there. So I think the goal that we all have is to lower the amount of people that are killed needlessly by firearms. And, and the last thing I'll talk about here, um, again, red flag laws I think are a really good idea. I think that the, the, the chance that you would be turned in by your neighbors just completely out of the blue on some kind of fake, um, you know, some posse gets together and just decides they want to take you down for no reason. Well, why are they doing that? Or, or maybe you are more of a problem than you thought. But on the second hand, I don't think it's that necessarily realistic that that's going to happen too frequently. Um, last but not least, people talk a lot about, you know, well, should we make knives illegal? People kill people with knives. You know, I can kill you with a pencil. I can kill you with this desk. I could somehow smash your face into this desk. I'm 220 pounds. I could probably do that. Okay? I could kill you with this iPad if I were to throw it at you like David and Goliath, right, and hit you perfectly. I could kill you with a lot of things. The difference, though, I think, is that every one of those things that I mentioned, including a knife, has a use outside of killing someone or killing so to speak, being the key word. Yeah, a gun can be used to kill prey uh, or an animal, you know, something you're hunting. But it's there, it's only made to kill. A gun is not made for anything else other than that. Yes, it's used for sport shooting and, you know, skeet shooting and stuff like that sometimes. But those are things that evolved out of it. And every one of those people also started using a gun, not because they like shooting clay pigeons. And thought that was fun, but because, you know, they they became enamored with, with real guns first. And I, I know you get a power trip from it. You get a power trip from shooting an AR-15, just like I get from my motorcycle. You know, especially from a sport bike. Get all that power between your legs. You want to use it. it and, and, and sadly, it's the same thing with a gun. So I also don't think that good people turning in their guns really helps. So I'm interested in the conversation here, guys. Um any comments that you have below, you know, post the comments below, share this show with your friends. Um, if you want to check out the podcast, you can do so by going to www.vfupodcast.yolasite.com uh, along with my hosts, TJ and Big Haas. We have a lot of nice, uh, cool stuff that we talk about there. So this will probably be one of the longer videos that I do. Um, I might even do another one on here because like I said, I, I, on this one, I don't have I am not the beat all that end all. I'm not the grand poobah of gun knowledge. I'm just looking at something from a common sense perspective. And again, I think that both sides have some good arguments here. Um, and I think that this debate needs to be undertaken with a lot more civility and realizing that, hey, you know what? Maybe the other side isn't absolutely crazy. Let's listen to what they say and try to figure out some legislation that actually works. Because the overall ban's not just going to work on guns, maybe on AR-15s, but um, but also doing nothing is obviously the wrong thing as well. So people, let's do something. And that's with all things being equal on all things equal the vlog. Thank you very much, guys. We appreciate, I appreciate you joining the show and, um, we'll see you soon. Laters.